Well, a pleasant good morning to everyone and welcome to this seminar, virtual seminar in celebration of World Food Safety Day, marked on June 7th. Now, the second World Food Safety Day was celebrated on June 7th under the theme, Food Safety, Everyone's Business. Now, the intention was to continue to draw attention and inspire action to help prevent, detect, and manage foodborne risks, contributing to food security, human health, human economic prosperity, agriculture, market access, tourism, and sustainable development. Now, following the success of the first celebration in 2019, this year, we are again reinforcing that call to strengthen commitment to scale up food safety. And this year's theme promotes global food safety awareness and calls upon decision makers, the private sector, civil society, UN organizations, and the public to take action. But what can we do, particularly in a post COVID-19 world to ensure that from farm to table, the food we consume is safe and will not cause damage to our health. Well, we have an esteemed panel here today to talk with you all about that. And I'm going to introduce them now. My name is Lisa Bailey, by the way, and I'll be taking you through today. We have Sub-Regional Program Coordinator for the Caribbean at PAHO, Mrs. Jessie Shutin. We have Ms. Renata Clark, she is the Sub-Regional Coordinator for the Caribbean and the FAO Representative for the OECS. And we also have Dr. Joy St. John, Executive Director of CARFA. And thereafter, Dr. Lisa Indar, she will join us also from CARFA. She's Assistant Director, uh, Surveillance Disease Prevention and Control Division. And then we'll go in to discussing safe food markets with Dr. Margarita Corrales from Panaftosa. She's a food safety specialist. And following her, Ms. Carla Marcel Boyce from Trinidad and Tobago, advisor to the Ministry of Agriculture, will talk to us about the continuous food supply chain and its importance here in the Caribbean. You will, of course, be allowed to ask some questions and we will make sure to try to get those answers to you. So we are going to get started now with welcome remarks, and I'm going to ask Mrs. Jesse Shatin, Sub-Regional Program Coordinator for the Caribbean and the Pan American Health Organization, to please bring the welcome remarks. Jesse. Good morning, and welcome on behalf of Papua to this virtual seminar in celebration of the second World Food Safety Day. World Food Safety Day, as you may know, was initiated by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization and officially recognized by the United Nations Assembly in 2018. As you're aware, we actually celebrated World Food Safety Day on the 7th of June and held a press conference in the Caribbean. Subsequent to that successful press conference, we are pleased to be continuing the celebration with this technical webinar with the FAO and with the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA. As we celebrate World Food Safety Day, we are reminded that food safety is everyone's business. Every year, nearly one in 10 people around the world fall ill and 420,000 die after eating food contaminated by bacteria, viruses, parasites, or chemical substances. In the region of the Americas, an estimated 77 million people suffer an episode of foodborne illness each year, half of them under five years old. Further, foodborne diseases generate an estimated 19 million in annual health costs in Caribbean countries. This year, we celebrate virtually and in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also at the onset of the hurricane season, two phenomena that have the potential to impact food safety. COVID-19 is clearly transmitted from person to person, and there is no evidence of continued transmission of the virus from animals to humans through the food chain. However, the most proven hypothesis about the origin of COVID-19 is linked to a traditional market where food is sold with animals and animal products, creating an ideal environment for contamination between animal, food, or in persons. This is not the first time that we've seen this. In the last 10 years, we've seen epidemics of SARS, avian flu, that have also been associated with transmission from animal to humans. The application of sound principles in environmental sanitation, personal hygiene, and food safety practices will reduce the likelihood 
that harmful pathogens will threaten the safety of food supply, regardless of where the food is sourced. This week also marks the first week of the official hurricane season, as I mentioned, and forecasts indicate that the Caribbean will experience above normal hurricane season. Food security and safety are important to emergency and hurricane preparation and recovery. And we've been working with countries to ensure that all disaster plans have food safety included also so that the food and water supplies remain safe. Food safety is a shared responsibility of governments, producers, consumers. All actors and people along the food value chain are responsible for food safety. How can we get involved in world food safety? The right actions along the food chain from farmers to consumers, as well as good governments, regulations are all essential to food safety. Five steps that we can take that make a sustained difference to food safety. One, ensure it's safe. Governments must ensure safe and nutritious food for all. Two, grow it safe. Agriculture and food producers need to adopt good practices. Three, keep it safe. Business operators must make food safety and ensure that food is safely transported, stored, and prepared. Four, check it's safe. Consumers need to access need access to timely, clear, and reliable information about the nutritional and disease risks associated with the food choices. And five, team up for safety. Governments, regional economic bodies, UN organizations, development agencies, trade, consumer and producer groups, academic groups, and research institutions, and private sector entities must work together on food safety issues. I want to thank you and recognize Panastosa for their work on food safety at PAPO and also the FAO and CARFA. I hope you enjoy the learning on this technical webinar. Thank you. Okay, I see I should go ahead. <laughs> I'd like to thank PAHO and CARFA for inviting me to join this discussion. I'm really pleased to be part of this um, technical seminar, again, to celebrate World Food Safety Day, the second annual celebration, as you've just heard from Jesse. I've been working in the area of food safety at the FAO headquarters in Rome for many years. And from that vantage point, I must confess that I was uh, concerned that the Caribbean was not highly visible in the food safety discussion internationally. From my new vantage point, I've been in Barbados for just over a year, I can see that there's quite a bit happening in the area of food safety. But I, I can also see that there's quite a bit that still needs to be done. So the whole purpose of World Food Safety Day is to drive this reflection among individuals and institutions in public and private sectors about what each of us can do in, in his or her role to contribute to making food safer. I do hope that next year, perhaps we can have a reflection on where we've gone over the former year in terms of, of, of strengthening our resolve and, and, and creating change. At this moment, it's difficult not to see things in the context of COVID. So by now it has been repeated by many people on many occasions that there have been no reported cases of COVID-19 being foodborne. It is not a foodborne illness. However, the whole of government response to COVID-19 and the recession that is expected in his wake does put some responsibilities clearly on the food safety community. We've all heard the growing call for increased intra-regional trade. And that means that all countries within the Caribbean have a responsibility to make sure that their national food control systems are credible and that they don't create inefficiencies and obstacles for the movement of food within the region. We have also seen major disruptions in the food chain due to poor adherence to required hygiene protocols in processing facilities and in markets. So food safety authorities must play a central role in enabling food businesses to interpret in a very practical sense, the physical distancing, 
the sanitation and the hygiene provisions that are required to contain the spread of the disease. So with that, I look forward to hearing about the state of food safety in the Caribbean. And I will be discussing with uh, PAHO and CARFA, how can we organize this to each year recognize the change that we have made, that World Food Safety Day is making a difference, pushing a reflection and driving action. Thank you. Dr. Renata Clark, Sub-Regional Coordinator for the Caribbean and FO FAO Representative for the OECS, Mrs. Shitani, Sub-Regional Program Coordinator of the Caribbean of PAHO WHO, Dr. Lisa Indar, Assistant Director at CARFA, Dr. Margarita Corrales of Panaftosa, and Ms. Marcel Boyce, of the Ministry of Agriculture of Trinidad and Tobago, participants all. It is my great pleasure to bring remarks at this virtual seminar in celebration of World Food Safety Day. Food safety is a global priority and an important public health issue since foodborne diseases are a major cause of morbidity, mortality, and economic burden worldwide as outlined by Mrs. Shutane. The Caribbean Public Health Agency is pleased to partner with PAHO, FAO, and the Government of Trinidad and Tobago in this focus on World Food Safety Day 2020. This year marks the second annual observance under the theme, Food Safety, Everyone's Business. Through this theme, we hope to spread global food safety awareness by involving all CARFA member states, by using a whole of society approach to governments, private sector, NGOs, and the general public. This theme is very appropriate during the COVID-19 pandemic, as cooking has become a pastime during the lockdown, and the pastime has spawned many small businesses with new modes of food service, be it curbside pickup or delivery. Now more than ever, we need to be creative in ensuring food is safe. Food safety encompasses all the steps taken from farm to plate to prevent contamination and foodborne illness. Everyone has the right to safe, nutritious and sufficient food. And therefore this must be a shared responsibility between governments, producers and consumers to ensure the food we consume is safe and will not damage our health. In this regard, food safety will become one of the best weapons to fight COVID-19, as it can assist in ensuring the risk factors for NCDs and obesity are addressed with safe, good food. In the Caribbean region, foodborne diseases continue to increase and have huge impacts on public health and the economy. Thousands of people in the region experience one or more episodes of foodborne illness every year. Food safety is also a significant health security issue since foodborne diseases can rapidly spread across borders through travel and trade. Consequently, food safety is among the top priorities identified by most CAFA member states given the dependency of Caribbean countries on travel and tourism. Let me outline some of the key roles everyone must play in ensuring that the food we consume is safe. Food handlers should be vigilant about handling and cooking food properly, whilst consumers should be aware of safe food practices and practice proper hygiene before consuming foods. Governments must set the food safety standards in legislation, while the private sector must invest in plant equipment and systems which promote adherence to those standards. In this way, food safety is everybody's business. To adequately detect and monitor foodborne diseases, an integrated farm to table approach is required. In partnership with PAHO, CARFA is implementing an integrated 
integrated foodborne diseases program, integrating the epidemiological, laboratory, environmental, and veterinary aspects of foodborne disease surveillance and response into a coordinated program approach, both at the national and regional levels. Its multifaceted components of surveillance training, capacity building, outbreak investigation and research, preparation and control are addressing foodborne disease in a holistic manner. Recent activities include the sub-regional foodborne disease CARFA WHO workshops in 2017 and 2019, and a PAHO manual on foodborne disease surveillance. Dr. Lisa Endara will give you more on the status of foodborne disease in the Caribbean region. CARFA has also trained and certified over 500 persons in nine member states in advanced food safety and has developed a suite of hospitality, health, food safety and environmental standards to provide a basis for effective food safety programs in the hospitality industry. A final word on the current COVID-19 pandemic. In echoing what Mrs. Shutane said, the virus cannot directly cause COVID-19 through foodborne illness and cannot be transmitted by foods. But it can spread from person to person by direct contact with respiratory droplets produced by sneezing and coughing. The virus could be passed between customers and food service staff by respiratory droplets left on common high touch surfaces countertops, doorknobs, for example. So food handlers and consumers must implement strict hygiene and sanitation methods, especially hand washing, good cough and sneeze etiquette, social distancing and wearing of masks to ensure the virus is not spread between themselves, restaurant staff and to customers. CARFA is committed to continue working with PAHO and FAO to provide harmonized technical support to improve food safety and thereby food security in the Caribbean region. I thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to Drs. Roy St. John, to of course, to Renata Clark from the FAO and to Mrs. Jessie Shotin from the Pan American Health Organization. Of course, telling us if you're just joining us and hello to St. Martin who has joined us online about the need for a partnership-based approach, the need for multi-sectoral action. And even though COVID-19 is not spread by food, but about the things that we can do to make sure that food safety is considered, the, the work that's happening with food handlers, the need to have a creative approach to uh, farm to table, making sure that food is safe from farm to table and the key roles that we can all play. So right now we're gonna take a little break from talking and take in the World Food Safety video for 2020. Welcome to World Food Safety Day. This is a special year to recognize the efforts of the people who work throughout food production so that it can reach your home safely. Farmers, carriers, retailers, buyers, and sellers. Thank you for being there in crisis situations like COVID-19 to ensure that consumers have constant access to safe and healthy food. On this day, we want to thank all national governments for creating and implementing policies and regulations to guarantee food safety. We want to recognize the great work of farmers and producers for adopting good practices to grow safe food. We want to highlight the importance of business operators for using food safety programs to keep food safe. We all have the right to consume food risk-free, safe, healthy, and nutritious. 
Food safety is a shared responsibility. Every one of us, from governments, international organizations, consumer organizations, and academic institutions, among others, work together for safety. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that video and please make sure you keep all of your questions for after the presentations. So we're going to have three presentations now and it's going to be moderated by Laura Lee Boudram. Just let me tell you a little bit about the presenters before I hand over. We're going to have a present presentation by Dr. Lisa Indar. She is Assistant Director of Surveillance, Disease Prevention and Control Division at CARFA and they will be sharing the status of food safety in the region. She will be followed by Representative from Panama Tulsa, uh, she is Dr. Dr. Margarita Corrales. She's a food safety specialist at Panama Tulsa, which is the Pan American Food, Foot and Mouth Disease Center. It's a scientific center of the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, and they've been carrying out important work in the control and eradication of foot and mouth disease since its inauguration in 1951. And they continue to work through technical cooperation in zoonosis. Um, so she's going to be talking to us about the importance of safe food in food markets in the Caribbean. Very important, particularly now in COVID-19, as people are, I think, eating more from the markets than ever before. And then Ms. Carla Marcel Boyce, she's an advisor to the Ministry of Agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago, will talk to us about the importance of a continuous food supply chain in the Caribbean. I'm going to hand over now to Laura Lee Boudram, who will moderate the session for you. And please remember to put your questions in the chat. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we are going to start with our first session today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Indar. Uh, Dr. Indar is a public health scientist specializing in infectious diseases, travelers' health, and food safety. She has over 17 years regional and international experience in the surveillance and prevention of infectious diseases and managing and executing regional public health surveillance and response programs. Dr. Indar is currently the Assistant Director of the Surveillance, Disease Prevention and Control Division at the Caribbean Public Health Agency, or CAFA, which is the sole integrated regional public health agency in the Caribbean responsible for preventing disease, promoting and protecting health in the region. And uh, CAFA serves approximately 26 member states. Dr. Indar is also the head of the Regional Tourism and Health Program, which is an innovative program that addresses health, safety, and environmental sanitation threats to tourism with the aim of strengthening regional and national health systems to enhance the health of visitors and locals within the Caribbean region. So I'm now going to pass you over to Dr. Indar to give her presentation on the status of food safety in the Caribbean. Good morning. Are you able to see my screen? No, we are hearing you, but we're not seeing your screen as yet. Okay. How about now? Not as yet. Can you confirm if you're seeing my screen? It appears as though it is coming. It is there now. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so um, good morning again. Uh, all protocols observed. Uh, Kafa is really pleased to be part of uh, celebrating World Food Safety Day. And given the limitation of time, I will go straight into the presentation of presenting a regional update uh, for food safety in the Caribbean. And 
given the current impact of COVID, I wanted to bring a bit of the sun and the sun and the sea to you, even if it's by photo today. Okay. I want to start with this one slide that really speaks about a recent study that we would have conducted in the Caribbean, um, a Caribbean burden of illness study, which showed that one in every 49 persons would likely have a diarrhea or gastroenteritis due to consuming contaminated food or drink. However, this number decreased greatly when there were mass gatherings, such as, you know, the things that we love, the carnivals and the parties and the limes, as we see. And it was actually one in 11 persons that may become ill. So the next time we go out, we have to always be very cognizant of the fact that, you know, um, when we're in a large gathering, that there's a likelihood of a foodborne illness, uh, depending um, on our patterns of practice and how we consume food. So why all, why is food safety so important? Well, food safety is key to improving the health and well-being of a population. The way to improve safety is to reduce foodborne illness. As uh, previous speakers would speak, would, has spoken, is that um, indicated that foodborne illness is that illness or gastroenteritis that arises due to consuming contaminated food. If we reduce foodborne illness, we will improve food safety and thereby food security, which is a key millennium developmental goal. If we can improve food security, we will have safer, safer healthier product and healthier, safer tourism trade as an economic security. So therefore building economic stability in the region. What is the impact of foodborne disease? Well, we know it's a serious public health issues. However, even though it is so common, it's important to know that it's also preventable. So it's a common but preventable public health uh, problem. It is the leading cause of illness and death, especially in less developed countries, uh, causing over 2 million deaths, the majority of which are children. A recent study also by CDC estimated that each year one in six Americans get sick uh, with a foodborne illness. However, the thing with foodborne diseases, which impacts on our food safety, is only a fraction between 10 to 15 percent is reported. And we all know that when we get sick with a bit of foodborne disease or a small diarrhea, we are hardly or unlikely to visit the doctor. We tend to self-treat. So this was spoken about by uh, Jesse in terms of what is the, the impact, the World Health, uh, this World Health Organization overall impact, showing that every year one in 10 persons get sick with a foodborne disease. So everyone has a role to play. In the Caribbean Burden of Illness Study, we also found that the estimated economic cost is about $21 million per year. That is quite high and just for treating and preventing foodborne illness. 43% of those were kids, were children, less than five years of age. What we also found in that study um, is that there was a gross amount of underreporting and underdiagnosis. So this is a critical issue in the Caribbean. Over 80% of the foodborne illness was underreported. So it means that the data we have there that comes out in our annual reports, it's about 20%. That is what that is actually occurring. So we need to improve our reporting and we need to improve the testing of foodborne illness to be able to have uh, more accurate um, data to facilitate proper prevention. The most, uh, one of the key findings do is that the bugs or the pathogens that cause uh, foodborne illness in the Caribbean were norovirus, which is a viral illness that spreads very rapidly among person to person. And this was followed by Salmonella, Campylobacter, and uh, um, Jardia, which is um, also important in terms of our finding because this is a parasite that tends to live in, in um, you know, contaminated water. 
So it speaks of the need really to proper washing of our vegetables and use of proper and safe water. So this was very instructive. This data was very instructive in terms of how we develop uh, prevention measures, especially for the Caribbean. This study also showed that what we tend to report was varied, um, not just in terms of country, but also in terms of our annual data. We also ca carried on the study to, to look at the economic impact and we compare that with the US, the USA, um, the economic impact was over $17 billion and our cost was $21 million, which is sometimes more than the entire budget for some Caribbean countries. This, the issue though with foodborne diseases and food safety is that it has no boundaries. We are highly dependent on travel and trade. We are the most tourism dependent region. And it is very easy for foodborne diseases to be transmitted and increased due to globalization. Uh, the fact that food production is no longer restricted to one country, um, our increased travel and trade, new and emerging pathogens. Uh, the fact that all of our islands are so close to each other, there's a lot of intra-regional travel and integration. And this is supported by inadequate surveillance for foodborne diseases. Uh, to say a few words on tourism, we are, when we look at our data, over 50% of our foodborne illness tend to occur among our traveler. Travelers die on foodborne disease as the most, is the most common cause of illness in the Caribbean. And again, it's the same types of pathogens. It is ongoing and costly, but it also impacts on economic sustainability. So it can ruin a visitor's stay. So food safety then for the Caribbean is even more important for ensuring you know, safe and healthy tourism. What is really required to ensure food safety? Well, there's, according to the WHO, you need to have proper food safety system. This includes your laws, your management, inspection services, epi surveillance and laboratory services, which is where CAFA's uh, remits falls, plus information, education, communication, and training. However, it's important to know that to have effective surveillance of foodborne disease, you require an integrated farm to table surveillance. It means you need to trace the food from the farm to the consumer and integrate the laboratory, vet, veterinary, um, environmental work, as well as the epidemiology work to be able to get to the source and develop appropriate prevention measures. So given that most foodborne diseases are zoonosis, that integrated farm to table approach is needed where we want to be able to link the pathogen to the source. This is the approach that has been taken by CAFA and its predecessor, CAREC, when we started our foodborne disease um, program in 2004. And this approach continues um, even to today where we have been working with the four key sectors and epidemiology, laboratory, environmental health, and veterinary to create a multidisciplinary integrated farm to table approach. Um, within CAFA, we work closely together and more importantly, within the agencies. So the, the work for food safety and foodborne disease is done in partnership with our key partner, PAHO, as well as other regional partners. How do we conduct the work? We do it through a, a series of measures, syndromic surveillance, where we look at our gastro data, our laboratory-based surveillance, which we collect monthly, where we look for these key pathogens, Salmonella, Shigella, Cholera, Campylobacter, E. coli, Vibrio, Norovirus, Rotavirus. And we also have our outbreak surveillance, where we look at immediate reporting. And in some countries like Belize and so on, there's integrated surveillance where we combine our clinical food and animal data. So to date, we would have strengthened this type of integrated surveillance in 14 of our countries and built our laboratory capacity in the same. Well, I spoke about the burden of illness studies that was done in eight countries. 
Um, we have created teams in countries um, where lab, epi, environmental health and veterinarians tend to be part of the monthly country uh, meetings that talks about and promotes intersectoral collaboration for food safety. What is our data showing? When we look at our outbreak data at CAFA, we see in the last, since 2000, uh, since 2000 to the last, to last year, foodborne disease still represents most of our reportable illness. So if you look at this data set here, this graph, it shows that 96% of the illness that is reported is foodborne. And then this is followed by respiratory, vector-borne, and so on. So it really speaks about the importance and the economic and uh, uh, health burden foodborne disease presents to the Caribbean. When we look at our cases that are reported in terms of the pathogens, salmonella, of course, continues to be very prominent. But then this is followed by cigatera or, or fish poisoning and Campylobacter, Shigella, and norovirus as, as the top organisms that are causing illness. What is more important though, in the last five years, we have seen a big increase in norovirus. And that is important to us because as we said, this particular illness spreads very rapidly from person to person. And it is very difficult to, 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 to um, prevent because it stays on surface for long periods. So this norovirus is our number one cause of illness among our cruise ships, uh, as well as you know mass gatherings that are occurring in hotels and um, mass gatherings like big events. In terms of the types of salmonella, the big ones are typhimerium and enteritis. So therefore it talks about, this really speaks about animal related and air, uh, products, uh, meat and eggs that are the key types of illness. St. Paul and Mississippi is also related to particular countries where you have uh, wild birds uh, that are prevalent and that are uh, defecating on water supply found too is that the salmonella serotypes vary by country and this is very instructive and we would have worked into terms of developing country specific measures based on their types of salmonella. In terms of our outbreaks we see in terms of the foodborne outbreaks norovirus leads norovirus and salmonella leads followed by other um, illnesses. This helps us to determine again specific country specific measures for foodborne diseases. And this graph shows some notable outbreaks. A lot of people would have seen that outbreak in Turks and Caicos that occurred at a hotel, but you know, resulted in a lot of people being ill, over 700 persons being ill. And um, this was a reason we also developed uh, real-time surveillance for travelers related uh, illness. What I also wanted to discuss here too, throughout, while we are looking at foodborne diseases, we have established a tourism and health program. And because foodborne disease is a major cause of traveler's illness, we have also uh, strengthened the food safety work under our tourism and health program by developing early warning and response system. So this particular system looks at, uh, it really captures uh, syndromes, syndromic illness, and it can be done for a traveler as well as normal health and normal populations in the Caribbean. But it captures this information in a confidential manner and immediately analyzes and, and lets you know if there's an alert. Together with that, there are instructive guidelines on in how you respond. We also build capacity in, in an advanced food safety training and sanitation that is then uh, supported by a certification component that is um, recognized worldwide. Together with that, we would, have, we would have just completed seven hospitality, health, food safety, and environmental standards that really, will, uh, the purpose is to promote clean, green, and safe standards and thereby improve food safety. So these are some of our standards, I wouldn't, uh, the training, food safety training. 
And these are the different standards, food safety and water treatment and water testing, um, environmental sanitation that is now available as regional public goods for the region. And of course, in terms of food safety and COVID, we know that there is no evidence that shows that COVID is spread by food, water, or even mosquitoes. However, they can be spread by direct contact with respiratory droplets produced by sneezing and coughing. And this could be passed between customers and food staff by respiratory droplets left on the on common high touch surfaces. So we would have developed a suite of different uh, guidelines that really speaks about food safety, water sanitation, um, and hospitality guidelines. And it speaks about ensuring proper hand hygiene. Um, we have really nice infographics and proper hand washing, when to use gloves, social distancing, masks, practicing good cough and sneeze etiquette, you know, keeping um, even your food workstations, keeping two meters apart and showing that social distancing um, how workstations should be clean and sanitized and how often, and of course, ensuring that you're cooking all your foods properly, especially your meats, not serving raw and undercooked foods and washing your fruits and vegetables. And these are some of the infographics. They're all available on our website. You know how to wash your hands. We go a lot into how you clean and disinfect. Um, there is an interim guideline right now that is going to go out today on... Um, what the hospitality industry be, should be doing and there's a section on food safety that really you know provides that guidelines and technical support for ensuring food safety in food um, establishments uh, so this is another part of the guideline that speaks about cleaning handling and stuff and so on and my last slide speaks about through our tourism and health program we have just created a, well in march we created a caribbean Tourism Task Force, that um, is a partnership between CHTA, that is the Hotel Association, the Tourism Association, and the Global Tourism Resilience Center. And it speaks about the real-time surveillance, advanced food safety training, our health guidelines, the standards, and the reporting. And of course, um, we are launching a Caribbean Travelers Health app that really speaks about healthier travelers um, and what are the measures for that the Caribbean is doing for improving healthy travel, including food safety. So with that, I want to thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank, thank you very, very much, much, Dr. Indar. Uh, we don't appear to have any questions at the moment. Um, I did want to say, though, good morning to our participants online. I'm seeing several representatives from uh, Curacao, St. Martin, Trinidad, Brazil. So very good to have you join us this morning for this very important session. Um, we're now going to move on to our second presentation in the panel lineup. And here we are going to have uh, Dr. Margarita Corrales, uh, who is a food safety specialist with uh, Panoptosa um, Veterinary Public Health, PAHO WHO. And she's going to be giving us a talk on the importance of safe food markets in the Caribbean. Margarita? Well, here, my name is Margarita Corrales, and I'm working for PAHO to, in the food safety unit, which is located in Panaftosa, which is the center of uh, veterinary public health and food safety and glander disease, which is situated in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And in this presentation, I would like to talk about the importance of safe food markets in the Caribbean. Well, everybody knows that traditional markets are very important because they are a source of affordable food for millions of people and they are essential for food security of urban areas, rural areas and millions of people. Also have an important critical social function and also they are a source of income for the community and also for tourists because they always like to visit these traditional markets. But in some markets, they also sell and slaughter live animals. And actually, the trade of live animals is very important 
not only the domestic ones or life of livestock, but also some white animals. Um, but somehow these animals are traded illegally and there is no controls. And then it can happen some problems like the wet market in Wuhan in China, which has highlighted that some lack of control can lead to emergency zoonotic diseases, as it happened with the coronavirus. Well, here you can see some headlines from different press releases where they indicate the, the, that a potential source of the COVID-19 it was in Wuhan's wet markets. Uh, you can see many stories of this. And well, this arise uh, the issues of the of the food markets because there is a lack of control of animals that are sold there. Also, um, in the food safety air arena, there is a lack of separation between between raw food of animal origin and ready to eat food. Also, there is not too much attention on food safety guidelines, infrastructure, etc. Also, some markets they lack of basic infrastructure, and some vendors and food handlers they don't have basic knowledge of food handling. Well, I think everyone shows these numbers, uh, which which are alarming, honestly, because as you see, 77 million of people fall ill in the Americas every year because of foodborne diseases. And the most vulnerable population are children below five years. And the main agents that cause these foodborne diseases are microbiological and are narrovirus, Campylobacter, E. coli, and Salmonella, as Lisa showed that in the Caribbean, Salmonella is really an issue. Well, for a safe food production, we see the safe products, but behind them, there is a lot of work, a lot of efforts at all levels from the farm to fork. So from the soil and water that it needs to be of good quality during harvest and storage. So everything needs to be clean, good hygiene conditions. The storage must be proper, adequate with the, with the temperature, humidity, etc. animal health. Workers' welfare is also very important, installations and equipment and transport. All uh, play an important role to produce safe food. Normally, uh, countries follow the guidelines of different organizations uh, that have very good explicit good practices. Uh, we have the guidelines of the International Plant Protection Convention that it focuses on an, uh, plant health of the world um, animal health organization, OEA, oh yeah, which focus a lot on animal health, and Codex Alimentarius, which have a lot of the standards, guidance, and good practices on food safety. Well, the main food hazards, I think everybody knows by now, but I would like to rem remember because it's always good to keep in mind. They are microbiological, that they are bacteria such as Shigella, Salmonella, Staphylococcus aureus, Vibrio, uh, Brucella, that can occur in contaminated milk, etc. Protozo, uh, Toxoplasma condi, for example, uh, Giardia lamblia, and others, and virus, Hepatitis A, and norovirus that can also be transmitted by food. Physical hazards are debris or piece of crystals or bones, etc., that can appear in the food. And chemical, it can be residues of pesticides, environmental contaminants that can be heavy metals or PCBs. Also additives, some food producers can add too much additives and they can be harmful for, for the public. And the general symptoms or the initial symptoms of foodborne diseases are fever and headache, vomiting, diarrhea, and stomachache. But these symptoms can even get worse. And actually some diseases such as arthritis, uh, neurological problems, uh, kidney failure, and cancer can be associated with foodborne diseases. Um, well, it's important for that, in especial for the food markets, um, 
to keep uh, food safety measures and everything good control to avoid the spread of foodborne diseases. And it's important first the market infrastructure. So it, it must be built with durable materials that are easy to maintain, clean, disinfect. Also the food contact surfaces need to be also easy to clean. And now, especially in this time of COVID-19, uh, it needs to be also a good physical distribution between the market post and with the clients, because otherwise it can create agglomeration of people and it can spread also the COVID-19. Also, the market needs to have basic uh, drink, uh, drinking water supply and basic services. Uh, it's important for cleaning and disinfection of surfaces and tools. Also to guarantee hand washing. Every market should have like a water reservoir, soaps and paper towels, a trash bin that everyone maintains her, her ha their hands uh, washed and clean. Good. Um, here just a few messages uh, to keep in mind when you visit the, um, uh, the traditional markets and in general in this pandemic of the COVID-19, it's important to keep good hygiene practices. So wash your hands frequently, clean and disinfect all high contact surfaces, use personal protection equipment, also about touching your face while wearing gloves or if you are not wearing gloves also because it can be transmitted from your hands into your eyes, into your mouth, etc. And also practice respiratory etiquette. So please sneeze or cough in the angle of your elbow and also use disposable tissues and throw them into a bin and cover it just that they don't, they don't come out and um, and contaminate and also please practice social distancing between people of at least one meter and always use hand sanitizers with at least 70 percent alcohol if possible well uh, for food handlers it's important to keep the food safe so separate live animals and raw food from animal origin from ready to eat foods also, you have to protect the food market areas from environmental hazards like rain, wind or other hazards that can appear. And also you have to keep the food at right temperature. So if it's ready to eat food, it needs to be hot. Please keep it hot. If it needs to be keep hot, uh, cold, sorry, uh, please keep it cold. Here, uh, Pajo uh, last year developed a very good food handless training that you can visit and follow it and is intended for all these people who are handling food. But I recommend to everyone for consumers, vendors, processors, etc. because it has the key message to keep food safe. Well, here are just some examples of some markets. For example, here in this market, you can see cheese. And uh, well, you cannot see any traceability stamp. The, um, also, uh, the packaging, I don't think is correct for the cheese. And also, it's not stored at cool temperature. So, it should be stored at, very, at cold temperature because otherwise, uh, microorganisms multiply. And also, here, this chicken. Actually, the chicken looks very nice, amazing, very big, and it must be tasty. But you don't know how the production was. Maybe the farmer was using growth promoters or antibiotics. There is no stamp, no inspection stamp, no traceability. And also here is just a store at room temperature. So this chicken can cause a risk to the consumers. So please be aware of these things in the markets to improve. Here also we have more meat products at room temperature. And actually at room temperature, the microorganism multiply very fast. And if the consumer later doesn't apply the five keys for safe food, they are going to, they are going to, they are likely to get foodborne diseases. 
Here also, and cool fish, they are not using ice, it's on the ground, uh, well, in a dirty surface, there is also risk of foodborne diseases. And the same here in this market, uh, which the fruits and vegetables are practically lying on the ground and in dirty surfaces, and there is a, la a high likelihood of cross-contamination. So that's why consumers also, as I said before, need to eat safe and keep food safe. And they need to apply the five keys for safe food. And these are keep clean. This is personal hygiene, uh, wash your hands, also clean the surfaces and all the tools that you are using with food. Also separate raw and cooked meat because it can be cross contamination. Use different tools for uh, handling cook uh, meat and raw meat. Also cook food slowly because over 70 degrees the microorganisms start to die and actually it kills the microorganisms so it will be safe to eat the food. And also store food at safe temperatures. So it's, they should be stored at 5 degrees or below or cook over 60, 70 degrees. These are the safe zones, but in between is a risk zone that I will explain in my next slide. And last but not least, use safe water and raw materials, because if you use water that is contaminated with heavy metals or microorganisms to wash your fruits and vegetables, automatically everything gets contaminated. So please wear, uh, be aware of the raw materials and water. Here, just for reminding, so some the ideal microorganisms growth conditions. So they need nutrients, water, temperature, oxygen, and time. Temperature is very important. As I mentioned before, below five degrees, the microorganisms are, they are not killed, but they are totally slept and they cannot reproduce. And over 70, 70 degrees, they die. So they don't multiply. But between five and 60, the microorganisms start to multiply. So then it's not uh, recommended to leave food at room temperature over two hours because it's when the microorganisms start to grow. And then if someone eats it, can have risk of some foodborne disease. Well, as we talk about the one wet market, so I would like just to highlight some some points on zoonotic diseases that are those transmitted from animals to humans, and is they are responsible of 65% of the human diseases, which is quite high, although um, people are not aware of it directly. So they can be transmitted by aerosol from aerosol from animals to humans, also vectors. So some insects uh, like fleas. Uh, mosquitoes, etc., can transmit these agents from infected animals to humans. Also, from proximity with animals, if someone has a cat or a wand, there can be an exchange of corporal fluids from animals and, and humans, and then the person gets infected. Or also directly from bites, from maybe a dog or a cat, so it can be some contamination. And also from products from the um, from derived from animals, for example, milk or meat, uh, which it comes in the foodborne part. Well, here just um, to show you the risk of zoonotic diseases, it can come from wild animals, and here is a series of zoonotic diseases like. Rabies, brucellosis, West Nile virus, Salmonella, avian influenza, and more recently, coronavirus, but it already happened in the past. But in this time, it got more awareness due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Also from livestock, there is some risk of zoonosis if there are not good practices applied. For example, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Leptospirosis, um, Trichinella, Tuberculosis, 
uh, antimicrobial resistance, etc. Also domestic, uh, our loved ones uh, can also transmit some diseases if they are not vaccinated accordingly. And they can transmit Campylobacter, Toxoplasmosis, Rabies, uh, Salmonella, etc. And later we have another one, Synanthropes, that they are those that they live together with us, but they are not domestic particularly. And they are Campylobacter, they can transmit Campylobacter, Rabies, Salmonella, and Antivirus. Well, here to show, yes, because of the COVID-19, uh, it's believed that it comes from an animal, a bat, just to show you the story of um, trans animal transmitted coronavirus to humans. And it's likely that in one in the 1100, there was already a transmission from a bat to humans of the call NL63. In 1800, um, from bats and livestock to humans. In 2003, it was well known the, um, the acute respiratory syndrome that it happened in Asia, that also uh, the origin is said to be from bats that passed to pangolins and pangolins to human. In 2012, it was the Middle East respiratory uh, uh, syndrome that it happens to be passed from a bat to a camel and a camel to a human. And more recently, it was the SARS CoV 2 that is believed that it was passed from a bat to a pangolin and this from a human. But still, they are collecting evidence and try to support this hypothesis. Well, just to show you how the uh, zoonotic disease transmit, transmit between humans and animals. Uh, the most likelihood is that these are transmitted from domestic animals to humans because there is more contact. But in rare cases, there is spillovers from wild animals to domestic animals. And in this case, there is a big transmission among animals. But also it can be a spillover from wild animal to human and then it happens the human amplification. Also, there are vectors that can transmit these diseases um, to wild animals, domestic and humans. Well, uh, the Caribbean is not exempt from having uh, well-organized markets. And we can see that in some countries, I'm not going to mention the name, but they sell wild animals. Uh, we have seen some mar markets that they are selling live iguana and also other starters, other some um, guinea pigs. And these are some are catch wild and they are not inspected by veterinarians. And who knows if they are infected with some diseases that they can be passed to humans. That's why the sale of these animals needs to be regulated or more controlled in the wet markets. So then to reduce the zoonosis disease in markets, uh, as I said before, to regulate and monitor the sale of live animals in the markets, also avoid contact with sick animals or animal products in poor condition, and regulate or prohibit the sale of wild animals because some animals are caught illegally and these animals shouldn't be say, sold at all. Well, here we see some visitors in a market, some street dogs. We don't know of their health, so maybe they can transmit rabies or other diseases. So it should be more controlled, honestly, this in, in the traditional markets. Also, traditional markets need a pest control program uh, that ensures that the market is free of rodent or other pests. Also, to use some treatments that can be chemical, physical, uh, or biological, but that they don't oppose a risk to food. And also, the chemical treatment that is used, it should be approved by competent authorities. And also, a waste management program 
but because trust shouldn't be accumulated in the in the food market also it should be a periodic collection of this waste and the containers need to be clean uh, before reuse because it can accumulate some bacteria that they will never go away and just last but not least i just want to show here an initiative that ecuador had and they include a market certification program which is uh, free of cost in in the in ecuador and it's just to improve their markets they decided they want to improve just to sell safe products and without health risk and also to improve the quality of customer service and also to enhance the advantage of fresh organic but also indigenous products from small holders also they are giving some advice on balanced diet how to eat correctly to prevent obesity and having a good nutrition which is also improving the social cohesion between people and i think it's a good initiative and well it's just fit for thought for the caribbean countries that I think it's always good to improve and at all at all levels of the food production chain, but also in our traditional markets. And with this, I'm finalizing my talk. Um, I will give the floor then to Laura Lee. Thank you much for following. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Margarita. Just wanted to acknowledge our uh, online participants. I see we have more folks bringing greetings from the Tix and Caicos Islands and Jamaica. Uh, Margarita, we do have one or two questions from our uh, participants. Um, uh, so uh, Juan Pablo has indicated that, you know, in some cities across, you know, Latin America and the Caribbean, um, there may be instances where the water supply is not very regular. Um, can you make any recommendations for food markets in the face of um, irregular water supplies? Yes, um, well, it's true. Some, some cities there is no running water and, and then in these cases the market needs to to prepare some tanks or some reservoirs or some sources that there is a drink, uh, drinking water. It needs to be treated. So um, just to ensure that it's safe. Um, well, in case of Venezuela, it's, it seems that it's very critical, but I think there are methods uh, for chlorinating the water um, to add some, some chlorine uh, in some proportion. And then I think it's, it's something that the countries need to take into account to provide to these markets this type of treated water. Is what I recommend. So if it's not safe from the tap, uh, there is a specific concentration, uh, but this concentration also varies uh, with the country. That's why I don't want to give a specific percentage but I can send you some guidelines just to take tap water that maybe is contaminated, but just to add some chlorine uh, to make it suitable for, for drinking and also for washing and et cetera. I hope I could answer your question, uh, Juan Pablo. Uh, sure, Margarita. So there's one last question from Juan Pablo. In terms of uh, certification for organic foods in traditional markets. Um, you had mentioned an initiative from Ecuador in terms of uh, certification of markets, etc. Um, are there any initiatives for traditional markets? Well, um, here in, the, in Latin America and the Caribbean, not much, but there is really a specific guidelines for organic foods to sell in markets. And we can offer support to the countries for this, but actually these organic foods are really strict measures from food production to sale. And it has a lot of requirements, but a lot of people sell uh, foods because they produce at home and they indicate that they are organic. 
but really uh, they can't use ingredients that they are not organic. This makes the food not organic. So there is a way of certification of organic food, but it's a long way with a lot of requirements, but it's possible and we can offer support on this. I hope now is answered. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Margarita. So thank you for uh, the questions from our online participants. Uh, we're going to get into our final panel session for this morning. And here we have Ms. Carla Marcel Boyce, who is an advisor with the Ministry of Agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago. And Carla is going to give us a short presentation on the importance of a continuous food supply within the, sorry, a continuous food supply chain in the Caribbean. Uh, over to you, Carla. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in. Good morning to all the presenters from around Latin America and the Caribbean region. Uh, my presentation today, I'm going to be touching on food safety in a globalized world, looking at the importance of a continuous safe food supply chain in the Caribbean. So I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to off my webcam so you all can focus on the presentation. Okay. So I apologize again. Um, I'm going to continue where I left off. But for those who are just joining in, my presentation is food safety in a globalized world. Right. So the sources of food supply for the Caribbean region, we have two main sources, domestic production and imports. For domestic production, we all know that um, for the region, agricultural production has fallen despite the increases of internal demand for food in the region. Um, because the agricultural sector has been plagued with a myriad of issues. Um, just to name a few, you have farmers with uneconomically small farms. They have low production and productivity levels. Um, unfortunately, farmers are not actually too keen on the use of technology, new technology for agriculture. And then we have an aging population, population group where you find that more in Trinidad Tobago specifically, agriculture is not seen as a lucrative industry, industry and therefore it's not seen as attractive to the young entrepreneurs or the agri entrepreneurs, right? We all know a simple thing that over the past couple of years, when you look at national budgets for the Caribbean or CARICOM countries, agriculture usually gets the smallest piece of the pie. So maybe this could be an attribute as to why we don't have an increased domestic production um, for agriculture in the Caribbean region. Agriculture or domestic production is usually seen as a byproduct of export agriculture. And I'm going to talk a lot about globalization in my next couple of slides and how globalization has affected the food supply chain around the world. Imports. Um, for the Caribbean region, the last figure that I have is that we import at least six billion dollars, um, US dollars in food and food products in the Caribbean region. Right? The region is highly dependent on food and food products from the US, from China, from Europe. You could see for more than 80% of its food supply comes from those international countries. And in light of COVID-19 and what we're currently going through, this is a wake up call for the region is that we need to start being self-sustainable. We need to start growing what we eat and eating what we grow. And as my colleague had indicated earlier on, that because of COVID-19, you found that you had a lot of people doing home gardens, kitchen gardens, et cetera, in order to try to put more nutritious food on their plates. So food supply chain disruptions. Um, as they presented before, Ms. Jesse Schultz and she indicated that the Caribbean region, we are basically vulnerable to natural disasters and we're coming into the height of the hurricane season in the Caribbean region where we may or may not be affected by several tropical storms and hurricanes and other natural disasters. Um, international economic situations. Um, earlier on, uh, we had the global economic recession in that 
there was a disruption in the food supply chain looking at farm to fork where we were not able to receive or purchase certain goods it was not available to us because of those issues happening abroad um, food laws and regulations another attribute of food supply disruption whereas some caribbean markets are unable to meet stringent food safety um, standards or regulations that govern food control in other countries in which they are trying to export their product. For planning and forecasting, that is an issue that we have seen in the agricultural sector over years. And the one we're currently in, the public health disaster, current COVID-19 pandemic. The globalization, we've heard it say before, um, Dr. Indara indicated and spoke about globalization in her presentation. And what is globalization? It's basically connecting the world movement and integration of different people among different countries. The mere fact that the Caribbean region has a food import bill of over 6 billion US dollars, it just goes to show that the changes in consumer preferences and there is an expansion in agricultural trade. Food that is produced in one country is being consumed in another country millions of miles a week right and then we have the emerging trend of e-commerce where we have a greater availability and diversity of food um, in the u.s region you have for example those online food companies that you just place an order and it's delivered right to your door and things are coming through to the caribbean region i should say um, i can speak for my country Trinidad and tobago through what we call freight forwarders and skyboxes, where food and drugs and cosmetics can slip through the cracks and end up in, to the consumer without the necessary checks and balances. So the challenge is faced by Caribbean countries because of globalization, right? We have ingredients coming from multiple countries. We have various fields, various farms, and various factories, thus now exposing our population to different hazards, hazards which may not have been in need to the Caribbean region, we are now exposed to such hazards, right? Our national food control authorities, we now have no direct oversight over the production and manufacturing processes. We usually now rely on a certificate, a proof, a certificate from the country to which we are importing that product from to give a certificate indicating that the product that we are receiving is safe and wholesome and is good for human consumption, right? Another thing we are seeing to be due to globalization is that there is a possible increase in diet-related health and nutrition challenges. With the advent of convenient foods, where you can just go to the supermarket and pick up something that is already pre-packaged and prepared for you, it's ready to cook, ready to eat. Most times, it's high in salt, it's high in sugar, it's high in fat, but it is the easiest food for you to pick up and consume. Right. So I'm going to just touch briefly, um, again, in the essence of time, on COVID-19 and the effect on the food supply chain. We've all seen around the world, most countries have implemented a lockdown or stay-at-home order. And therefore, that has resulted in a collapse in the demand for goods. It is not as easy as before to get your raw material, to get your input for your process, even to get a finished product. Um, in light of the current situation. We had possible completion of the stockpiles as food production and distribution chains were disrupted. The farmers were not able to get their produce to a particular market. People were not allowed to come out to purchase that product. And therefore you saw a shift, a shift sorry, in the whole food supply chain. It became more complex due to COVID-19. You actually had shortages of the animal feed, um, fertilizers and pesticides, they have increased the cost of farming and there's an increased risk of bad harvest. There were shortages in labor and transportation, etc. Another thing that we found out was that there was a reconfiguration of the supply chains, whereas the farmers, before they were selling to doing bulk wholesale sales, they were actually now selling to smaller markets and persons were actually setting up home delivery businesses. You found you had more harvest to home, harvest to home um, companies being set up where you were able to get your stuff delivered to your door, right? 
And then another thing too that is very ticklish, some countries um, started to impose export bans or quotas, basically just protectionism, just to ensure that whatever they are producing remains in their country for their population. So how do we ensure a safe and nutritious food supply chain? Um, from the graphic that I have there, you're seeing that the chain spans from primary production to processing and manufacturing and straight into distribution. So, for primary production, how do we ensure that it's safe? Um, looking at good agricultural practices, good um, hygienic practices, good farm practices on the whole would ensure that the primary production aspect of the food chain is safe. With respect to ensuring that it's continuous, we're looking to increase or ramp up domestic production and having initiatives where persons grow what they eat and eat what they grow. Um, I'm going to let you know that in, in Trinidad and Tobago, currently the Ministry of Agriculture, they have a Grow Trinbago project where they did a distribution of seeds for over 50,000 households in the, in, in the country. And the seeds were seeds of corn, bodhi, okra, pumpkin, melon gen, and pigeon peas. Whereas you are now allowing or promoting that the consumers grow what they eat and eat what they grow. So that is our motto as Grow Trinbago. So that is one way we were looking to ensure that we have food and there's a continuous supply chain of primary products. The imports, um, ensuring that imports were safe. We had our what health officers ensuring that the imports that were coming in, looking at the permits, the permits for meat and meat products, the permits for plants and seeds, etc., the permits for finished products. They were doing their due diligence, ensuring that it is safe, and they look at the aspect of maybe a flexibility of the enforcement of the food labeling rules because because of COVID-19 we found out that some markets were inaccessible whereas sometimes maybe some had the market was the U.S. however they were not able to get it sold to the U.S. so they sent it to the Caribbean region where the different labeling standards would be different so we looked at possibly doing some sort of flexibility of enforcement because nothing is generally wrong with the product. It's just that the product labeling does not meet our requirements, requirements of our law, right? Um, we decided to do risk-based inspection manuals that was ramped up in the event of COVID-19 just to ensure that food businesses were operating, they were practicing um, safe, safe measures and protections measures against COVID-19. And Margarita, my colleague Margarita, touched on that. Dr. Corrales touched on that, the safe food in market. So I'm not going to go into that aspect again in the essence of time. For processing and manufacturing, ensuring that it is safe, we actually had our inspectors going out into the plants, ensuring that they were doing practicing good manufacturing practices, ensuring that what they say that is being produced at the plant is exactly what is out for the consumer. And the last part of the chain is the distribution to the consumer. As we all know, for the consumer, we ask you to eat it eat safe and keep it safe because sometimes this may be the weakest link in the chain. Um, the, the previous steps where they would have been doing everything in their, in their power and they will to make sure that what comes out from that step is safe and wholesome. However, sometimes that when it reaches the consumer level, there's a breakdown due to improper cooking practices, improper storage and handling. Um, for example, Dr. Corrales spoke in one of her slides, she showed photos of fish on the on a counter, a bare counter, um, being subject to adverse temperatures, depending on the species that is affected, that was shown there, that species could be high risk for, for histamine poisoning, etc. And as consumers, we are not mindful sometimes that we have to make an informed choice and we are the ones to drive change in the industry. So sometimes you purchase that and then you put it in the trunk of your hot vehicle, you go make all your run your errands all around, um, different grocery stops, go to pick up the kids, etc. And you have that food inside of your trunk, and then you come home and then you put it on the counter, and then you cook two, three hours later, and then bam, you have your family is now suffering from football illness. So again, as we were saying that the thing for food safety today is food safety is everyone's business and everyone along the food supply chain, they have their responsibility to ensure that they do their part. So the other player in the chain is not 
affected by the bad decisions that they make. So I'm very sorry for, for this very condensed presentation. However, most of the points that I had going to speak about was actually covered in the previous presentations. So once it is covered, I have no issues. So that is why I omitted that from my presentation. So again, um, thank you for the opportunity. And if you have any questions, I'm going to pass this off to Laura Lee. Laura Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Caller. So from our online participants, uh, we just have one. OK. Uh, couple questions. Um, one is from Beverly. How do we balance the demand for land for housing and for agricultural land? Uh, perhaps a little bit of a difficult one. Uh, Carla, any? Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi, Beverly. Well, it depends on the, the policy of I believe whoever is in government at that point in time and whoever is responsible for um, state lands. And therefore they would have a policy as to how much of the state land or state resources is allocated for housing and how much is allocated for agricultural land. So that is a high level policy decision that unfortunately I would not be able to tell you outright how does one balance that demand because that will be, a, as I said, a high level policy decision. Okay, noted. Thanks, Carla. Um, we have a question from Karen Krishnalu. Hello, Karen. Okay, um, I think this is directed to Dr. Indar. Um, Carla just wanted, um, okay. Uh, Lisa, by chance, are you still there? Dr. Endar, are you still online? Okay, um, Karen, not sure at the moment if Dr. Indar um, connection is stable at the moment. Um, however, we will address your question in terms of sharing the impact of the enforcement of food safety and regulations on the status of food safety in the Caribbean. Okay, so um, we'll be able to send you uh, a note on that. Okay, so at this point in time, our three panelists have uh, um, given their presentation. So I'd just like to open the floor as we're closing to any last queries um, on any of the presentations from our online participants. Okay, so uh, please go ahead. If you have any more queries, just type it in the chat for us. Okay, so we have one question from uh, Ms. Zita Emanuel. Uh, in the, the UK, there is a system for providing allotments to persons who want to plant food, but who do not have the space. Is that something that we can consider as land prioritized for agriculture decreases? Uh, Carla, can you uh, give us some feedback on this one? Um, just going over the question again. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Mr. Emanuel, I'll be sure to pass that suggestion on to the the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries to take that into consideration. Um, I know all the technical corporate agencies such as ECO and I think the FAO and who was actually helping us with respect to doing policies looking at that aspect. So yes, it's a work in progress, and we hope to see um some policy decision with respect to that in the near future okay thanks very much Carla um any other last questions uh, okay if not I'm just going to go into a general wrap-up from our panel Okay, so we started today's session uh, with some opening remarks from our various uh, collaborators um, hosting this webinar. We had some opening remarks from uh, Ms. Jessie Ann Chutain, uh, the uh, head of the PAHO Caribbean Regional Sub-Office. 
Uh, we had some remarks from Mr. Renato Clark from the FEO and uh, Dr. St. John. And essentially, they brought comments to us on the theme for this year's uh, World Food Safety Day, which is food safety is being everyone's business and the role of both producers and consumers in ensuring food safety. Um, just getting in a bit more into some of our panel presentations. Um, uh, Dr. Indar spoke to a few points on how food safety and improving food safety within the region builds regional health security. She cited the, both the global and uh, regional burden of foodborne disease and the impact that it has on the region and various measures that we can take in order to speak uh, um, to foodborne disease and how to address that. Uh, she looked at the impact of uh, tourism, um, sorry, food safety and tourism in the region. And uh, she spoke to a little bit, and all our speakers, in fact, have been mentioning the importance of COVID and food safety in the food industry and highlighting, in fact, that COVID is uh, not spread per se by food, but spread by respiratory droplets from person to person and from contact with high touch surfaces. So she mentioned the importance of uh, both food handlers practicing appropriate food hygiene and also consumers in ensuring um, the safety of the food that they purchase and manage. Uh, Dr. Corrales gave us a presentation on uh, food markets uh, within both Latin America and the Caribbean. And she looked at traditional food markets, um, which are usually accessed by local and local persons, as well as visitors. Um, the fact that there could be lack of uh, food safety handling practices in such markets and the importance for these markets to be able, for example, in constructing stalls, et cetera, that materials are durable, easy to clean. In times of COVID, she stressed the need for physical distancing to be maintained between food market stalls, the importance of water supply for sanitation and hygiene purposes. And of course, for both uh, um, food vendors as well as consumers, the importance when visiting these markets of respiratory etiquette, the use of face coverings uh, for both vendors and clients. So the important messages for food handlers were that um, food needs to be kept safe. Um, she mentioned the sale of both live and slaughtered animals, the importance of refrigeration. She brought us the five keys on uh, food safety, which is keeping your environment and your person clean, separating our raw and cooked foods, making sure your foods are cooked thoroughly, so at appropriate temperatures, and of course, the use of water. She also highlighted us the importance of zoonotic diseases and how diseases can be transmitted through different vectors, especially in relation to the sale of live animals in markets. Uh, Ms. Carla Boyce from the uh, Ministry of Agriculture in Trinidad brought us a presentation on food safety in a globalized world. Um, a few comments on that food safe, sorry, food production globally has fallen due to various challenges faced by farmers globally. And but how has globalization affected food supply and distribution within the Caribbean? Well, globalization is uh, um, where we are more interconnected. And uh, with that, it has brought an increased demand for food and greater diversity. Now, bearing in mind there's a potential for the fall in food production, um, different measures have been recommended for the agricultural sector in order to improve or boost food production within the region. Uh, she brought us some messages with respect to COVID-19, how the pandemic and other factors have affected uh, food supply and distribution due to various lockdowns, etc., shortages in labor and transport. Um, one mechanism to promote food production is not necessarily leave it in the hands of the farmers, but to also promote uh, homegrown initiatives. Basically, you grow what you eat. Okay, and lastly, she gave us uh, the links between um, highlighting the food supply chain and the various elements of primary production, uh, imports, processing and manufacturing and distribution. So those are some of the key points brought to us from the various panelists. At this point in time, I'm going to hand you over to Lisa Bailey, who will close the session for us. Lisa? Well, thank you very, very much, 
Of course, that was a very comprehensive. We thank you very much, Ms. Boudreau and Laura Lee Boudreau, for giving us that very comprehensive breakdown of what we learned today. It was a very interesting session, and all that's left for me to do is to thank everyone who joined us online. And just to let you know that they will be accessed given to the slides, so you can go to Panatosa's website and you will have access to all the slides that were shared today. I also want to say thank you to all of our presenters. This is Jesse, Jesse Ishutane, the Sub Regional Program Coordinator for the Caribbean and the Pan American Health Organization. Ms. Renata Clark, Sub Regional Coordinator for the Caribbean and the FAO representative for the OECS. Dr. Joyce St. John, Executive Director of the Caribbean Public Health Agency. And of course, our esteemed presenters, Dr. Lisa Indar from the CARFA, uh, the Margarita Corrales for her presentation and also helping us to put together this session today from Tosa and Ms. Carla Nelson Boyce, advisor to the Ministry of Agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago. And all of you for joining us. Thank you so much. And all I can left now for me to say is to remember that there's a role for everyone to play in ensuring that we make sure that our food is safe from farm to table, as they say. One, ensure it's safe. The government can ensure safe and nutritious food for all. We can grow it safe. Agriculture and food producers need to adopt good practices. We can keep it safe. Business operators must make sure that our food is safe. And consumers, we need to eat it safe because we have a right to safe, healthy, and nutritious food. And of course, we can remember to team up the safety because food safety is a shared responsibility. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope that you will go over to the website and take a look at those slides as well to give you more information. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.